Now it is my pleasure to introduce our Distinguished Teaching Award recipient, Dr. Leanne Taylor, who is an associate, oh, and there's her certificate right there being held up. You'll eventually get that in a nice frame and you'll have that. Um, so she is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Studies with the Faculty of Education. This award was bestowed upon Dr. Taylor in the fall and is, as tradition has it, she is here today to offer her thoughts and reflections on teaching and learning at Brock. Dr. Taylor has a passion for social, social justice education that is grounded in real world learning. We are excited to have you as part of our event, Dr. Taylor, and now I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. I can I can hear the claps as I see the claps. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen, um, if that's all right, and get started. Uh, OK. And I hope you can tell me that you can see this. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> All right, so um, thank you so much, everyone. You can see I, I've titled my little talk today. You mentioned passion, um, <laughs> Madeline. Um, passion, patience, and perseverance teaching across the threshold are, are the key words that came across for me as I was thinking about today. But I wanted to start by saying I, I'm, it's truly an honor to, um, to be this year's recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award. And it's also my sincere honor, pleasure and privilege to be able to address everyone here today and join in this celebration of teaching excellence across a range of fields, disciplines, and contexts. Uh, I know many of us here share a passion for teaching and learning, and I know that um, this passion not only guides our work in the classroom, but it also informs the research for many of us, just as our research um, guides the work that we do in our classrooms. Um, many of us I know many of us also see this work as a vocation. So that's one reason I'm really quite pleased to, um, to be able to spend this time here with you today. Um, so uh, I really thought about what I wanted to say today and uh, what I wanted to share with you, especially to a room already filled with um, accomplished educators, academics, researchers and colleagues and students such as yourself and all of whom are already doing incredible work in your respective contexts. Um, but I wanted to also convey something meaningful so uh, and not just go on about my passions as you know some academics <laughs> myself included or want to do but uh, uh, but then something really interesting happened and uh, a couple weeks ago I received an email from a former student. And as I'm reading his email, I found myself saying, yes, this is where I want to start. This is where I need to start. And so I'm going to share that email with you, with his permission, of course. But um, but let me begin by explaining that, you know, as was just mentioned, I teach mainly courses focused on equity, diversity, and social justice across undergraduate, graduate, and teacher education programs. And the content that we discuss is often difficult, it can be challenging, it's frequently unsettling. Um, many students embrace it and work to learn and unlearn complex ideas, uh, but resistance is common. And to be honest, is actually expected when our main goal is to help students rethink what they know and consider critically a range of ideas and issues. So it's not uncommon for some students to push back. So the email uh, from student who's who I'm calling Sam as a pseudonym is someone I taught uh, two years ago, and he was one of those students who pushed back and started sharing his email with um, with his permission. And I put it up here to read through it. It actually is a few slides. It was a very long email. <laughs> <laughs> but very timely for me to receive, given that I was thinking about my talk today. So he says, Dear Leanne, I realize it has been a long time since I was in your class, but I had to reach out to you with an update and a thank you. When I was in your class, I did not understand or fully value what you were asking us to consider about social justice education. I come from a small town and have been hesitant to share my views on racism and other forms of inequity. 
I was also so worried I would be accused of something, so I'm embarrassed to say, it was easier to just avoid those conversations altogether. I didn't know if I could be the critical educator you challenged us to be. And if I'm being honest, I resisted appreciating why it was necessary. But I'm now actually teaching my own class in a racially and ethnically diverse school. And oh boy, I get it now. Your voice is in my head. It's like all these case studies and examples have come to life. So I just had to write to tell you that everything you did mattered, even if it took me a little longer to embrace. I am returning to all those questions you asked and resources you and my classmates provided, and man, I am grateful for them. I know I still have lots to learn, but your calm and critical voice is in my head guiding me. Just the other day, I found myself calling out the overt racism, sexism, and homophobia I see in the staff room. I see more clearly biases in the curriculum. I'm listening to students better and am taking direction from them in my teaching. I wish you could hear the rich and meaningful conversations we have in class. And yes, at me too. Um, and finally, he says, you know, I joined an equity team. I joined an equity team and a meeting with a group of like-minded teachers to talk about how we can be more equitable in our school. We really push each other, and I'm seeing how my students are responding. And maybe most of all, or hardest, I'm actually uh, I'm trying daily to check my privilege. I know this would not have happened without your course, your patience, and facilitation of difficult discussions that got me and my classmates to consider different perspectives openly and discuss different perspectives openly. I know I resisted, you know I resisted, and I know I still have a long way to go, but I wanted to tell you straight up that I get it and I'm on my way. Thank you for pushing me here. Thank you for believing in me. Please keep doing what you are doing. So uh, this was, you know, uh, why do I share this story? <laughs> and I, 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 and I, I swear I'm not sharing it to, you know, boost my ego, even as amazing it was to receive that email. Um, given the folks in this room, I'm sure many of us have likely received, you know, similar versions of these kinds of emails from students. But it was as I read and reread uh, this email, I realized it was speaking to the importance of perseverance and patience in teaching. So now, you know, how, how many of us have entered our courses? I was thinking about this. How many of us have entered our courses thinking about them in 12 week blocks, right? And then we find ourselves somehow counting down the classes. So ooh, 11 to go, seven more to go. <laughs> I can't see your faces. I'm assuming there's some nodding, but I, you know, I'm guilty of this too. Teaching can be difficult when there's so many other demands on our time and a pressure to cover so much material. So what ends up happening is that we sometimes forget that some of the most important learning and growth happens beyond the classroom. After we've submitted grades and after students have even graduated from the program, um, and that happens, especially if we set up the right conditions for it. So the question then becomes, what tools do we leave students with that will help them commit to and uh, their ongoing learning journey when they leave the course? And so Sam's email reminded me that sometimes knowledge needs to percolate. And we may not always see or know the impact that we have on our students. So Sam's email and, and others, you know, like it also remind me that we need to think about teaching as the long game. And this means, yes, recognizing that students will be on their own path. But um, I also like to consider the path that we are also on as educators as we build and hone our skills. So over time, my approach to teaching social justice and equity uh, focused courses has shifted over the years through, although my commitment has remained pretty steady. Um, I remember when I first started teaching at Brock 11 years ago, I was so passionate about teaching this stuff that I would often jump in and interject during class discussions. I felt I had to immediately correct misunderstandings and alleviate tensions uh, the moment they arose. Um, some of you might relate to this. We sometimes want students to, to get it right away, right? It's easy to feel impatient at times. So I found myself sometimes in the early days interrupting dissenting voices, 
in a way that ended up adding tension to the environment. And I quickly learned then, though, but while I'm committed to ensuring that the classroom classroom spaces are safe and uh, as safe as they can be and recognize the power elements within them, um, I needed to shift my approach because it's often the experience of sitting in tension that helps learning. So instead, I now tell myself to trust the process, to trust my students, to engage together in a more meaningful learning journey. And this means that students need to sit in some discomfort in order to come out on the other side with clarity. So I've come to realize that to do this work, I need to meet students where they are. So some of you have heard me talk about my teaching philosophy, which is guided by the phrase, start where you are, but don't stay there. The phrase is coined by a critical race scholar in the States by the name of Richard Milner. And um, this guides my practice and it guides um, not just my teaching, but my personal and professional interactions. Um, now, I'm not saying that we are not to hold people accountable for the bias or even the violence that might enter into our classrooms, but rather that this perspective reminds me that to instead create conditions and opportunities that push students beyond their starting points, whatever those may be. And so what I've learned is that if we take this perspective seriously, then it means we actually need to respect that starting point um, that may be completely different from our own. And so with Sam, he started the class from a place of feeling isolated, feeling resistant, combative. He started with prior experiences of not feeling heard. And he entered my class on equity and racism and so on already with his backup. So, um, but how, the question that's always so perplexing then is how then do you create a space of comfort when the larger goal requires us to become comfortable with discomfort. So to do this, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, course design and how to help students work with theory and with um, threshold concepts. So in my experience, many students resist theory. Uh, uh, again, I'm thinking some can relate and want to know how they can implement changes right away. So this is you know, evident among those who are even willing and keen actually to dive into the theory. There's still a bit of resistance to that theory. Um, and so I often reassure students that we will fill their toolboxes um, with tools and time, but that until we understand clearly what the problem is, we can never know for sure which tools are the best suited for the job. So I design my courses with the intention of moving students through that growth. Um, Put differently, I tell students that surface understanding of the problem will only leave us with surface solutions, uh, some of which can actually do more damage than good when taken to, in my context, classroom, classroom situations. So for example, the intention of treating everybody the same can blind teachers from recognizing the different needs and experiences of students. Uh, that narrative doesn't allow us to combat racism that enters the room or the microaggressions that persist inside the classroom, our staff rooms, our hallways. So we talk about in my classes actually what's happening under the surface to contri that contributes to inequities before rushing in with the what we think are the solutions. Um, some of you uh, may already be familiar with this approach, but my teaching is grounded in an understanding of the importance of threshold concepts. And so threshold concepts are really um, essential for doing this, this work and, and adhering to this process um, because it, it asks students to progress toward bigger learning goals and understandings and overcome what folks like Paul Gorski has said co uh, calls cognitive bottlenecks um, in their learning. So in social justice teacher education specifically, key three threshold concepts might include things like privilege, discrimination, uh, the main isms, different forms of oppression. Um, and the most effective educators I'm learning draw on pedagogies that move students across the threshold. Because as, as Gorski and others have put it, once an individual crosses a cognitive threshold, the likelihood of reverting to previous ways of knowing is extremely slim. So it's really, really key 
in my view, to start there. And so I encourage students to be patient uh, as they build their structural understanding of concepts and issues so that they'll be armed with the tools to do the best job. And so we don't start by solving problems, but we spend more time looking at what is actually happening first and as well as who we are in that process, in relation to that process. So I ask students to consider theory as a guide and as a tool that can help them decide later if they really need to use a hammer or they need to use a wrench or they need to use a hacksaw to solve a problem. So when I frame when I frame theory and the importance of critical theory in this way, then students are, are I find are much more open to thinking deeply about ideas and issues. So in an article um, <clears throat> that I published with uh, recently with my colleague Julian Kitchen in the Faculty of Education and in a, another chapter that I wrote for a self-study about my, chap my, my, my research, again, the passion, we write about our research, we write about our teaching, <laughs> um, I wrote, um, I described some of the steps uh, required in successfully engineering courses um, with a social justice and equity centered um, focus and considered how to negotiate resistance and still keep that critical edge. So there's no secret formula here, right? I cannot predict what a class will look like. None of us really can. On many occasions uh, in, in, in my work, the, the plan gets thrown out uh, as the content that day gets lived out differently in the room. Um, people bring themselves into the room and the curriculum then gets lived in different kinds of ways. Um, and oftentimes how that curriculum and content gets lived can yield much more productive discussions in the end. But there is one process um, that I find useful. If we can't predict the formula, we can actually, um, I find one particular process quite useful. And that's in designing courses in phases that help move students across that threshold I was talking about. And you know, I, I draw on some of these phrases, phases that are from, um, you know, work in teaching for diversity and social justice. Um, <clears throat> so, so I just want to talk a little bit about this just to show you what I mean by process and how this helps me think about moving forward in my teaching. Um, so course design. Um, this process helps me kind of persevere and helps me gain trust in my process. And I begin by recognizing that although I start where students are, I have to have a plan to move them through these phases, right? So these phases I'll explain um, just briefly, but are confirmation, contradiction, and continuity. And confirmation uh, really is, is just about um, establishing a safe first, before I do anything else, the first phase is establishing a safe and respectful environment in which students can take risks, in which they can be vulnerable and begin to consider their locations and their assumptions. Saying that, I want to be clear that I know that not all environments will, can or will be safe for all. So I'm aware of the various traumas that enter the classroom and that can be perpetuated there. Um, one of my goals is to help students recognize instead what it means to engage in collective dialogue while understanding the ways that some voices are often excluded or silenced. So to help me do this, I often bring myself into these spaces and I open myself up to students in these spaces. And because I, I realize that when students care about us as educators, they are better able and much more willing to care about the content that we bring in. So of course, um, the more we care about our students as well, the better our teaching can become. So we all have different ways of doing this. And uh, for example, I found it useful to begin classes where possible with conversations about what students feel they bring to the space, the strengths that they bring. Um, we spend quite a lot of time getting to know each other, which has been quite interesting in an online environment, but um, has been working. <laughs> um, we get creative in how we work in the online space. Um, and I'm becoming much more adept using um, a lot of the technology and tools that are available for us. 
And I always start um, also with different with attention to the different social locations that we all bring as a way of considering and respecting how we are differently located in the room and thinking about how we use space, how we give up space and how we take up space. So this is where for most of my courses, I always start. And I find when I do that, it allows me to move then through the next stage, which is the hard stuff, the space of contradiction phase two, right? Which is once students feel that they can take risks, I find they are so much more receptive to having their prior beliefs unsettled through this space of contradiction. So contradictions um, are exposed through content that uh, corrects misinformation, challenges assumptions and creates opportunities for fresh ways of seeing. Uh, once students come to understand that their voices are seen, that they're heard, that they're validated, and they understand that my job is to push that thinking in a way that will create potentially discomfort, um, particularly those who come with firm views, then the process of disruption can happen. Um, so I help them along by sharing also how I am also challenging my assumptions and I give them clear examples of my own struggles. Um, I come at this from different angles. I use different multimedia. I try a range of academic and non-academic literature and I invite students to bring these into our spaces too, to keep challenging what we understand are the, are the issues and our relation to them. Um, and finally, um, you know, Continuity, which involves, you know, engaging in critique and developing action plans and implementing our learning um, is what kind of we hope happens next. And eventually students come for the most part to see that they need to do much more beyond the space of the course. And they often seamlessly start to make their own action plans as we as we near the end. And these action plans may include lists of resources that they want to explore or uh, questions they want to raise with family and friends or activities they want to try with students in their respective classrooms if they're teachers. I also aim for students to uh, resist feeling that they must have all the answers. So rather, I hope that they leave the course asking a host of new questions they never thought to ask before the course began. Um, and so when students note where they start, we often return back to the starting point um, and realize that we must start somewhere, then they tend to be better able to appreciate their learning as a journey and are more likely to understand their experience in the course as just one step on that journey. So as we come, you know, come to kind of bring it in to what I'm trying to say here is, you know, is I want to share some thoughts about what I've learned about navigating teaching and and when it gets hard. And so taking leadership roles in our classrooms and academic lives isn't isn't always an easy task. And although I've had many positive responses and I love what I do I have experienced my fair share of resistance, defensiveness, frustration, um, some of which can come through on course evaluations or in student disengagement. And there will always be times when, um, you know, I want us to think about those times, I'm sure when we all have felt at some point or another, when we want to throw the towel in partway through a course, worried that maybe I lost them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I missed something. Uh, so for me, I go back to these stories, stories like Sam's, and I remember that the process, when it's crafted with purpose, with humility, with critical thought, can work and often does. Um, I also try to remind myself that there is one guarantee. Anybody working in social justice education um, will know that. Uh, one of the degrees of social justice teaching is that it will, at some point, generate discomfort. In fact, the process of unlearning necessitates some form of conflict and cognitive dissonance as students' previous knowledge and assumptions are challenged. Uh, conflict, of course, is not always negative, nor should it always be avoided. And it also can be a sign of growth and the beginning of critical awareness. And uh, yes, I just cited myself, but that was from something that I wrote in a piece that's coming out where I really stood back and I really unpacked everything that was troubling me in my teaching <laughs> and uh, and how I tried to work through it. So um, and that was kind of a, you know, a reminder that I, I had for myself. So, you know, our efforts may not always land like we expect. Um, and it's important for me to remember um, but they might hit home later, as they did for Sam. 
So after all this, I want to leave you with a brief thought about leadership, about teaching, about vulnerability, about messiness. Uh, I've always admired uh, educational leaders and educators who share their vision and their ideas with a sense of vulnerability, openness, curiosity, and humility. Uh, these leaders, they work toward progress, not perfection, and in doing so, highlight their willingness to identify and learn from their blind spots. So the practice of intellectual humility, which is really something that asks us to set aside our opinions and engage with humility when we're encountering particularly the content that is upsetting or challenging or politically charged. And it informs that idea of intellectual humility and working through those threshold concepts to understand what's underlying the issues really informs my approach to understand power, privilege, and inequity in schools, communities, and society. Um, I also find that this approach and the process that I shared enables me and my students to move into the messiness um, and walk toward what's often called that learning edge rather than retreat into our comfort zones and become defensive. defensive. So I find by moving through this process, I can more easily move students towards that learning edge. And in my work inside and outside the classroom, I really try to affirm the knowledge in the room uh, and create opportunities for students to take the wheel, right? So, um, and I ask them to take the wheel in a variety of different ways, um, you know, in terms of making sure that they are contributing to um, the content of the course, that they're providing resources, that they're sharing their learning in some sort of public class way when when possible. So everybody is continually learning, learning from each other. But it's not always easy, and I'm not here to suggest that it should be easy. Teaching about, in my context, oppression and inequity is fundamentally difficult and emotional work. Um, there's been many moments where I, I've left the class wondering what, what just happened. Uh, that's not what I intended. Um, but I also have to do what I ask my students to do, which is take risks, so and informed risks, and work to do better after we inevitably trip and and fall, and uh, and we all do that. Um, so finally, I always tell my teacher education candidates, in particular, that one of the one of the most important things uh, to remember is that we need to teach students first. Uh, not subject first. And um, and so when that's at the forefront, then the care follows. And these are reminders, I actually have them listed and I, I have lists all over that I use to remind myself of what I wanna keep front and center. Um, I try to remember uh, this in my attempts to build confirmation and community. So build that sense of community in my classroom from the beginning. Uh, I try to remind myself to you know, resist complacency. So um, yes, I revise my courses pretty much every year, even some of them that can be considered well-oiled machines at this point, um, but I always revise them because I'm always trying to think about who's, who's in the room. Um, I try to meet students where they're at. So that goes back to the start where you are, start where students are, but don't stay there. So I always go back to where they are, um, but push growth. I develop a support system um, and encourage people to develop a support system to draw on your colleagues, to draw on your peers, to draw on the supports that are available, your critical friends to um, from whom you can seek support and learn. I learned so much from my colleagues um, since my time here. Um, I try to keep those threshold concepts central, so keep moving back to them to help um, keep our conversations real and honest. And uh, I always set high expectations. I actually find that that one's easy. Students students set high, very high expectations for themselves as well. And and ultimately, I, you know, I let students take the wheel in the way that I mentioned, take the lead, take the wheel. Um, in the way that I mentioned before, by making letting them know that this is always a space for them to bring in their own knowledge and resources and finding and learning. And finally, um, you know, I returned to where I started the discussion today, but perseverance in my email from Sam. And, you know, remembering that um, persevere, trust the process, remember that learning does not always happen in our class time. So these are some of the thoughts about teaching um, that I wish to, you know, 
put out there for us to think about as we celebrate um, the teaching excellence across the university today and continue with our celebration. And I really wish everyone well as you engage with whatever your passion is in your teaching, but engage with it with patience, with perseverance, and uh, in whatever area you're in. And at the end of the day, remember your work matters, you matter, and we should always remember that your students will often carry your guidance and your learning with them long after they leave your course. So thank you once again for the honor and the privilege of being with you all today.